Chernobyl was entirely preventable. That much is true. But the subject of what the operators and those in charge could have actually done to save the reactor, going back years before the explosion actually occurred that night, has not been touched by many. So, let's turn back the clock and look at some of the simpler decisions that could have been made in the years, months, and days, hours, even seconds before 12348 that could have shifted us into a world where Chernobyl did not explode. The biggest and most important factor in the Chernobyl disaster, the graphite displacers on the ends of the control rods. Their usage was improving the effectiveness of the control rod by creating large differences in reactivity between control rod insertion and retraction, which we have covered before. But, around 1979, the design of the control rod at Leningrad 3 was shown to be far too unsafe. There wasn't enough boron in the control rod. To correct the matter, the absorber section of the control rod was increased in size, and a section of the graphite displacer had been removed. This had the unintended effect of creating a larger water column at the bottom of the reactor, which led to the positive scram effect, discovered at Chernobyl Unit 3, and then at Ignalina and Chernobyl Unit 4 in 1983. Without the positive scram effect, you don't get the runaway at Chernobyl, and if the graphite displacers extend to the bottom of the core, you get forced control rod insertion to compensate for the positive reactivity. The reactor actually becomes safer. So, how do they fix this? Well, the technology was there at the time to do various things, including removing the water supply from these channels, running gas through them, which had been proposed and could have been eliminating the graphite displacers altogether. But there was also a simple solution, which is actually used in RBMKs today. Replace the graphite displacers with ones that fold into each other, much like a Russian doll, as I call them. These Russian doll displacers completely eliminate the water columns, and suddenly you have no positive scram effect, and the reactor is safe. Well, safe enough to not explode. Now, I know what you're thinking. Chernobyl guy, weren't the safety upgrades implemented after Chernobyl? Well, my friend, yes, but there were earlier ones. Following the positive scram effects confirmation of existence in 1983 at Ignalina and Chernobyl Unit 4 of all places, there was a dilemma on what they could do to eliminate this. Since reverting the control rods to the old design is not an option, the experts began brainstorming of various solutions to their problems. The final solution they came to, and one that was partially implemented through the reactor program, was adding the shortened control rods that inserted from the bottom of the reactor to the emergency protection system. This had actually been first proposed in 1977. Why wasn't it connected before? A simple voltage difference that nobody bothered to fix. Now, unfortunately for history, this simple fix was still being rolled out in the RBMK fleet, and even though Unit 4 did have maintenance shutdowns in 1984 and 85, and while the latter had been much shorter than normal due to Anatoly Mayorette's new energy policy, the matter of adding the shortened control rods to the emergency protection system was just a few hours of electrical rewiring, and was actually scheduled for the shutdown in 1986, according to a former operator, Alexei Fatahov. Moving on from the most obvious preventative measures, Let's look at the build-up at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant to the rundown, and answer a big question. Why did they do it? The idea was first proposed by Nikolai Dolzol, a decade before the accident, and supported by the bodies that built the reactor, like Zook Hydro Project. But the rundown was functionally useless, as actual accidents in the past, such as at Kursk 1, had proved that the reactor could survive the loss of coolant long enough for the diesel generators to start up. Not to mention how expensive the necessary changes to the reactor were to make this whole thing possible. And there are many people about to say Chernobyl needed to do the test because it was required for startup. And the rest of you know what I'm about to say. 
No. HBO is wrong. The Chernobyl nuclear power plant was the only reactor building that ever did it, and it was only attempted once at Chernobyl Unit 3, and never implemented there. Leningrad was actually approached to do the experiment, and they threw it in the trash. So, in summary, don't do the rundown. It was pointless and expensive, and another example of Dolazol doing something completely stupid. Okay, so you've abandoned the last point, and we're now going full speed ahead with the rundown. Well, the next thing to prevent the shutdown is to keep going, and don't end up following with the key of delay. This could have been done as easily as if they disconnected from the electrical grid just 10 minutes before the call was made, and would have likely occurred had the setup for the test been finished earlier, leaving the grid dispatcher to search for their extra electrical power somewhere else. Hope that the South Ukraine nuclear power plant doesn't accidentally shut itself down, or go the nuclear option and just say no to the grid dispatcher. Of course, due to politics, this was unlikely to ever happen, but on the grounds of safety such refusals occurred, like when Chernobyl Unit 3 was shut down the morning after the explosion. But of course, that was slightly more serious. Anyway, back to the matter at hand. In this case, the option to proceed with the test could have been met if a few factors came together and so I decided to include it on this list. A few more important people would have been present, which will be covered in the next segment, and this would mean that the reactor would have been under better control, and therefore a higher operational reactivity margin, and suddenly, the positive scram effect is impossible. Okay, so this is a somewhat complicated story. The Nuclear Safety Department actually created a computer model of the RBMK that could be used to correctly assess changes in reactor power and choose the right modes with the best operating reactivity margin, stopping it from falling below 15. This was used during every experiment to stop things going awry and requiring a shutdown that would doom the test. These programs were run by the Nuclear Physics Laboratory, who were always available at each power unit around the clock except for when the reactor was shut down and the person supposed to be on duty at midnight on April 26th was a former reactor operator named Anatoly Chernyshev. Unfortunately for history, a mix-up occurred and Chernyshev was wrongly told that Unit 4 was shut down according to schedule when he arrived, so he got the bus back to Pripyat and went to sleep. I wonder what you would have thought when he woke up to see most of Unit 4 missing that morning. However, if Toptonov had the assistance not only of a computer guiding exactly which modes of operating needed to be used to guide the reactor power down to the correct level, and with the right operating reactivity margin, but also an experienced former reactor operator at his side, it's hard to envision a scenario in which Toptonov loses control of the reactor and it drops. Speaking of which... Now, Toptonov remains, in my opinion, one of the best prodigies in the field of nuclear power. There aren't many who were as talented as him before or since, and he definitely had the ability to become a senior figure in the nuclear industry, like Boris Stoyachuk has today. But, Toptonov didn't have the experience to manage the power reduction of that night. He'd never experienced handling it at such low powers for that long before, and very few people would experience the unfathomable changes in conditions in the reactor in those last few minutes. It's not surprising with these chaotic moments that the reactor fell into conditions where it could explode. At the same time, Toptonov was being observed by Proskuryakov and Kudryavstev, two trainee senior reactor control engineers who were preparing to work in Unit 5, and Yuri Tregub who had previously worked as a reactor operator, was also present, along with Alexander Akimov. Knowing that the nuclear physics laboratory worker was not present could have been an incentive for Tregub to more carefully watch Toptonov's work, and in doing so prevent the sudden power drop that set the reactor on a course for explosion. After Toptonov stabilised the power back at 200 megawatts, 
with the combined help of Tregub, Akimov, Proskuryakov, and Kudryavstev, just to give you an idea of how difficult it was to recover from. Stoyachuk almost immediately attempted to correct the low water level in the system by opening the floodgates and letting loose on the feedwater flow at very high rates. This stopped effective mixing of the feedwater and the water already in the system, which led to cooler water entering the core and causing a collapse in the number of voids, thus reducing control rod insertion. Imagine instead a scenario where this was done slowly over a longer period of time. Better water mixing means reduced void collapse, and therefore decreased control rod removal. Suddenly, the operating reactivity margin maintains a safer level with more control rods inserted, and the positive scram effect all but disappears. There was a lot of miscommunication between the operators and the people brought in to do the experiment, and this results in an interesting situation. At 1.23.04, the rundown officially begins, with the turbine and the main circulation pumps running down. But the signal that actually switched on the measuring equipment and, more importantly, the backup diesel generators, would not be given until 6 seconds later. One thing to keep in mind here is that, while the generators were spinning up, they seem to have based the shutdown of the reactor on the moment the turbine fell below the permissible value for powering the pumps. So, with the diesel generators on and connected to the pumps, they would run back up and collapse the voids forming that would lead to the quick runaway and destruction of Unit 4. Of course, this definitely doesn't save the reactor from absolute destruction at this point. The initial insertion of positive reactivity is enough to raise the power up to almost 1000% for brief periods of time, which is not good. Damaged fuel channels, someone might get fired, but the reactor almost certainly survives, and this is the most important part. And finally, we're at the critical moment in terms of the accident, 1.23.39, not 40, as I have previously established in an earlier video. However, pressing the AZ5 button will inevitably doom Chernobyl. In fact, within the next 10 to 20 seconds, the reactor is about to undergo a power surge large enough to trigger an automatic scram that will blow the reactor up anyway. So, how do you stop this? The easiest solution wraps all the way around to the second point in the video. Insert the control rods that ascend from the bottom of the reactor fully. It not only pushes some graphite out of the core, but it drives in enough negative reactivity to stop the power surge, while also making an AZ-5 scram not explosive. It's also entirely possible that just inserting some regular control rods could be enough to prevent the explosion, if the positive scram effect from inserting those rods didn't trigger a power surge themselves. At the end of the day, plenty of methods are available to save the day. The real question is, which one do you choose? Of all these nine options, only some are plausible, in my opinion at least. Things like not shortening the graphite displacers require an understanding of the RBMK years ahead of even the best scientists in that field, whereas something as simple as a small miscommunication with Chernyshev could have completely doomed Chernobyl. One thing is for certain, by the time the rundown began, the margin for error was small, and with the mistakes made in the years before Chernobyl, it's hard to see a scenario in which another reactor wouldn't inevitably suffer a similar accident. And with the errors on April 25th and 26th, 1986, the margin between accident and inevitability was narrower than ever. <laughs>